Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're here in Gold Forest uh, this Saturday uh, to uh, um, hold our Chan class. Uh, typically, we uh, talk about uh, the uh, song enlightenment, where we're not really making headway at all. Uh, every Saturday so far, we've been discussing uh, answering questions. So anyone has any questions? Not that I'm complaining. Okay. Mm. Why we, uh, we chose to uh, look into the Song of Enlightenment? Uh, because uh, apparently, mm -hmm. I learned my charm from Master Xinhua, and um, uh, to the Chinese, uh, the Song of Enlightenment is uh, highly revered. Um, work in Chan. So I felt that um, for us to, in uh, an English-speaking world to learn more about Chan, uh, we should uh, look into these um, important um, work, important, important information from the Chinese um, treasure. And in particular, uh, we also have very fortunate in having a, an excellent translation from Chinese to English uh, made by Master Xinhua's uh, um, organization. Mm. And so should take advantage of it because typically the uh, translation into English from the, for the Chan materials uh, is actually very poor. Uh, I bought in the past so many books on Chan, uh, uh, on Chan, and uh, from the uh, on the, from the bookstores, and uh, now I look at them, uh, uh, I feel it's all junk. Um, but I'm cheap; I cannot bear to throw it away. Uh, yes, one. Yeah, but yeah, two thai. Hôm nay con thấy ở trên bảng hiện ra cái câu uh, nhược thực vô sinh vô bất sinh thì con rất mừng. Bởi đây con có dịp để thưa hỏi thầy là con từ lâu rồi con không có phân biệt được cái chữ vô sinh và bất sinh. Hai cái đó nó khác nhau như thế nào? Okay. Amitabha, for, Amitabha, for Master. So today, I was very happy to see on the screen there's a slide saying uh, so the Chinese is uh, if there is no really no production, there is nothing not produced. So I've been always confused between the word uh, non-production and the word uh, which is uh, no production. Um, is there any different? Uh, I'm the last person to ask about Chinese. <laughs> uh, it would be an insult to the Chinese uh, speaking people. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm clearly don't look Chinese. Uh, nor do I sound Chinese. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, from my limited understanding, um, I'm not sure why uh, the Chinese texts use Wu Sheng and Wu Bu Sheng. Uh, it's actually, uh, it's a, it's, if you could say Wu Sheng, Wu, Wu Sheng is the same thing as well, from my perspective. So it's really no difference at all. Okay, in terms of why they use wu or they will bu, uh, it's it's a, it's the same thing, it's the same concept. Okay, you could you could go into the semantics and say there's a difference between wu vo and bu, which is buk. Okay, and because uh, wu maybe it talks about a state uh, uh, that's uh, a state, whereas bu here refers to uh, an action, okay? You can go into that, but it's not, uh, that's not important, 
an important Chan concept. Okay? Mm. We go into this a little bit later, uh, if you will. But semantically speaking, there's no difference. Uh, uh, in, in some places I read, uh, 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 to say, say, Wu Wu Sheng, uh, or Bu Sheng, Bu Bu Sheng, it's the same thing. Basically, it's just the same concept. Okay? So don't be attached to the semantics. Unless the Chinese speaking uh, people have a better idea, huh? think about it and let us know. To me, there's no difference. From a Chan perspective, it's, a, it's a referring to, to, uh, to, uh, to, um, to the Buddhist wisdom. Uh, yes, too. Um, I'm here for myself. I think that's the, the difference between the uh, Voshen and Vo, Voshen. Uh, and um, I think it should be uh, Voshen and Vo Voshen. Because uh, in the Heart Sutra, Buddha said that uh, Vo Vo Min, Vo 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 Min Yi, Vo Vo Min Dang. That, uh, that how the, the Heart Sutra is said. So, so changes to Voshen, I think that maybe because he's uh, the, the patriarch, but he's not a Buddha. That's correct. Mm. What he's talked about, talking about is correct. Go ahead and translate. Uh, the Vietnamese translation is, is uh, instantaneous, right? I don't need to wait. Okay, fine. Um, typically, it's, uh, it's, um, they use a wu, you vo, they don't use bu, okay, in the text. But for some reason, in the text here that Master Shenhua used for the Song of Enlightenment is this. So for me, I'm not, I don't have enough wisdom to dare say this is, should be Master uh, Yung Jia should have said, uh, should have used, uh, um, not used Bu, okay, should have used Bu, okay. Uh, but it's, again, it's not that, that's that big of a deal, okay. Mm. I prefer Wu Wu. Sheng, okay, uh, because it describes knowledge, a state. Uh, it's not describing action at all, but it's the same concept. What he's talking about is is not the semantic. He's talking about you know, wisdom, okay. And if Master Yong Cha original, if this is, uh, this is his intention to use Bu instead of Wu. Uh, it's okay to me. You know, I find it acceptable. It's not that accurate, but it's illustrate the concept. Remember, you know, this was this this work was created uh, years ago, uh, and and uh, he's a seventh patriarch. He's uh, a direct descendant from Master Six Patriarch. If you ask me. It's, uh, he's very famous, but he's kind of a, quite a bit off uh, f to go down from the sixth page chart to the seventh page chart to his level. It's, uh, you, you, the, the Chinese child lost a lot, in my humble opinion. Okay? Mm. So that's why him being considered to be a, to be a patriarch, I, I respect. I grant the respect that he deserves as a patriarch. Uh, but uh, uh, so, and even in sutras, uh, uh, when they use wu wu, uh, wu bu, it's a, it's, a, it's a translator's choice to me. Okay? It doesn't bother me. But for him to use bu like this, um, I, I feel it could, you know, it's not that accurate, but it's acceptable, okay? Anyway, it's just my limited understanding of the Chinese language. YouTube. Somebody, I guess we're ready now. Sorry about that, Master. Um, good morning. We have a question from Ninja Checkmate. Hello, I have a question for today. Is playing the lottery okay 
for a lay person in Buddhism as long as I keep a balance and share winnings with the temple? I couldn't hear the first three words of your sentence. I will say it again. Hello, I have a question for today. Is playing the lottery okay for a lay person in Buddhism as long as I keep a balance and share winnings with the temple? It's better that you don't share with the temple. You give it to the temple. <laughs> hmm. But there is no um, prohibition in Buddhism against uh, gambling. Playing a lottery, you know, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, I bought some lottery tickets years ago. When I was driving all over Southern California looking for a temple, <laughs> and um, and um, I got desperate, so I said, "No money in the bank. No one wants to loan you money. What else can I do?" <laughs> so I bought five bucks worth of tickets. I won two dollars. <laughs> And that's the story of my life, my entire life. I bought tickets, lottery tickets, like several times. Always lost, never came out ahead. So I said, okay, my luck as a monk hasn't changed either, so forget it. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but that's about me. If you, have, uh, uh, if you like to play a lottery, like you go to Vegas, so there's nothing in Buddhism that is uh, against that. It's up to you, okay? Uh, it's no problem at all. All right, any other questions? All right, so again, as, as I was saying, uh, the, the, the Song of Enlightenment is very highly revered in the Chinese Chan uh, because he's a seventh patriarch. Uh, he became enlightened practicing on his own, and he got certified by the sixth patriarch, and, and as soon as he got certification, he said, okay, thank you, thanks a lot, I'm, 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 I'm leaving now. And the sixth patriarch looked at him and compassionately said, uh, why don't you stay a little bit longer? And he said, look at him, really? What do I gain from staying with you? But he's being Chinese, he's very polite, he said, okay, I stay. And so thank you for, for your invitation. So he stayed one night. And following day, he scamper, scampered out. Okay? Mm. And so, uh, so that's the seventh picture. He's a real character. And he went back to his, uh, his uh, village uh, to do what? To write his uh, song on enlightenment. Mm. Why is it important? It's important and why are we doing it for, for, uh, in English? Because he's the first one in, uh, in the history of, of, of uh, Chinese Chan to describe enlightenment. And he, since he got certified by the sixth patriarch and later recognized as a seventh patriarch, one of the seventh patriarchs, supposedly four seventh patriarchs, meaning that the sixth patriarch's teaching is so diverse that it took four of them to uh, grasp it. It's kind of cool, okay? And then, so, that's just my, my interpretation. And so, so, when he came back and he wrote this book, A Song of Enlightenment, and that's, I think that's the only real significant work he produced, uh, it, it's very, very unusual because it's the first time that a patriarch or a Chan master, a certified Chan master, talked about enlightenment. Okay, so that's why it's worth studying, and and it's a groundbreaking because uh, it gives us insight about enlightenment. Mm. And and uh, what he says is accurate, totally accurate. Okay, 
Um, so that's why uh, the Chinese revere this work. Uh, uh, so that's why it's worthwhile for us to look into it so that we're not missing out on this thing here. And if uh, people in the West, in the Western world, uh, talk about, would like to understand more about enlightenment, they should be reading this. Uh, and they realize that the enlightenment in Buddhism, as described by a Chan master, is very profound. It's a lot more than uh, how people here in the West, the English-speaking world, uh, bring up enlightenment. And have the notion of enlightenment is sort of like a joke compared to the, the Buddhist enlightenment, concept of enlightenment, if you will. Okay, and so it's a very insightful. Mm. Mm. All right, so the context is before this slide here. Uh, he says, who is without thought? Who is without birth? That's why next, it paves the ground for this. All right, so let me remind you, uh, in Chan, the reason uh, we, give the, give, we, we provide you this Chan training is in order to bring you the state of without thought. Okay? Uh, because you cannot stop thinking. And that's why you're confused. The fact that you cannot stop thinking means that you should not be taken seriously. You should not take yourself seriously. I'm being polite, okay? Meaning that you're so confused that uh, your thinking, uh, you lack clarity, clarity of mind uh, because you cannot stop thinking. So this is in, in, in Mahayana, in Chan in particular, uh, the first measure of wisdom is the ability to stop thinking. And Chan training uh, is designed to bring you there. We can talk all we want. We can do a lot of big, thing, big things, uh, things, but eventually you must be able to stop thinking at will. And that is wisdom. Without that, you have no real wisdom. Your wisdom is partial. Okay? Who is without birth? Okay, uh, that's the same concept. No birth, no thinking, same thing. Okay? Mm. Don't want to go too much into it. Okay? Uh, all right? Uh, so uh, it's because of thinking that you have birth. If you can stop thinking, then you have no more birth. What does it mean? It means that for those of you in the West who are crazy about that, especially there's a new billionaire now, there now who's uh, trying to go for, to lengthen his life, go for immortality, like, uh, like uh, the first emperor of China, okay? <laughs> just, just like the first emperor of China, that emperor spent so much money trying to find the elixir of of, uh, of youth, okay, to never die, okay, and so this uh, no is no surprise. Humanity, mankind is 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 uh, is um, obsessed with it, uh, uh, because once you have a little bit a little bit of success, you begin to realize how fragile you are, and how uh, short life is, okay, uh, and you don't get to enjoy and the success you work so hard to achieve. Um, so this guy is, no, to no surprise, uh, also, uh, I think he's a billionaire, right? Am I right? Uh, he's, he's making the news recently. 
and so he, uh, he, he spent a lot of money doing research and sponsoring research, and he claimed that he actually has an age, or actually reverse aging, okay? Uh, whatever it is, he, can st he still will die, because he, uh, uh, because he uh, is with birth. If you have no thoughts, the secret to longevity, the secret to youthfulness, the secret to long life is uh, to reach a state, is Chan training, okay? Reach a state of no thought. When you have no thought, okay, then you will no longer die. For example, these, these beings who can suspend their thoughts, mm -hmm. Will, will not die. So you live a lot longer than, let's say, the Chinese Taoists, okay? They're famous for that. They're famous to live for a long, long time. As Master Shenhua has said many, many times, multiples of 10,000 years, this is what the Taoists are capable of doing. And they do it by cleansing the body of illnesses, okay? Mm. And also because of the Kung Fu practice, uh, they're, are they able to reverse the wear and tear on their bodies? So actually, all men look like youth, have this youthful glow and look, okay? Uh, but they eventually will die because they, they cannot stop their thoughts, okay? Whereas in Buddhism, uh, we have this practice here where when we reach that type of state of no thought, then we can live as long as we want. We can live a lot longer than any other pursuits. And why don't we do it? Uh, because it's not that much fun to live that long. Think about it. The wife you love so much died <laughs> before you do. So, so, What's the point in living without a good wife? The younger wives, they don't understand you at all. Never mind, uh, it's, a, it's a man's problem, okay? Uh -huh. right. So you see, in Buddhism, we can live for a long, long time too, but we think it's not important. It's, it's not about length of life, it's about what you do with your life, the meaning of your life, is that's what matters to us, okay? All right, so that's the background. The next section is that if there is really no production, there is real, uh, there's nothing um, not produced. Okay, and this is um, this is it shows this here shows the level of wisdom of Master Yong Jia of the author. See, before when you talk about no thought without birth here. It's talking about the first level of wisdom, where you stop your thoughts. Therefore, you can lengthen your life. You can choose to die when you wish. All right? Yeah. If you don't wish to die, you can live. You, you keep on living. Okay? Hmm. But why? It's always a Buddhist uh, uh, preoccupation. Why do you live? Why are you here? Okay? Why are you doing this? Uh, and then he, this this phrase here uh, is cer is a certification that Master Yung Jia is understands uh, the middle way. His level of enlightenment is pretty high. That's why he's the seventh patriarch. So this refers to the fact that um, uh, the the understanding that uh, there is. If you understand, your wisdom understands about no production, uh, then you also understand that nothing not produced. What is nothing not produced? Hmm? That's wonderful existence. Nothing not produced is existence. Non-production, no production is emptiness. Nothing not produced is existence. Now you understand why the semantics of wu, wu sheng, or wu bu sheng, or wu, wu sheng is the same concept. It's about wonderful existence. 
how you phrase it, how you use, what kind of semantics you use, doesn't matter. Okay? This is Buddhist wisdom. Hmm. First, you need to understand Wu Sheng, no production. And then later, as you continue your practice, as your wisdom increases, then you'll be taught about Wu, wu Sheng. Okay? And that is enlightenment in Buddhism. For example, for your reference, oh, thank you, I don't know why today my throat is so dry, I'm nervous, I think, um, or something. My throat feels raspy. Uh, what was I? In Mahayana, especially in China, we train you so that you reach a level of enlightenment. That's what we call uh, low level enlightenment. That's called, we call bodhisattva levels. But here he's talking about in that range of mahasattva levels where you're higher level enlightenment, where you understand more. Uh, you, you'll be taught about wonderful existence. Below that uh, is emptiness, true emptiness. That's what my teacher taught. He taught my generation true emptiness. So we stuck on true emptiness. My, peer, my peers are stuck on true emptiness. And Master Shui Hua, for some reason, chose not to teach them, not that he doesn't know, uh, because his level is so high. Uh, he, but he chose not to teach them about wonderful existence. That's why the wisdom below for this, I call it Hinayana Mahayana, and upper level is Mahayana Mahayana. Okay, so what does it have? Upper level, you have wonderful existence, and you have certain teaching. Down here, you don't. And I don't understand why he, didn't, he never you know, taught my generation. Uh, Way Mountain. Nam mô A Di Đà Phật. Con chào thầy. Um, con muốn hỏi thầy là cái cái mình thỉnh cái bài vị um, tạm thời vãng sanh đó, thì uh, khi mình thỉnh bài vị đó cho bất cứ một ai, thì nó có ảnh hưởng gì tới mình hay không? Tại vì hồi tuần rồi con có thỉnh hai bài vị, một cái cho một bé bi, một cái cho một cái người 60 tuổi mới ra đi ở Việt Nam. Thì con thấy um, trong người con nó cũng bị nhức nhói chút Thì con không biết nó có ảnh hưởng tới con không Hay là tại vì cơ thể mình nó như vậy Cảm ơn Thầy um, uh, Nam mô A Mi Phổ Hello Master, I have a question in regards to uh, requesting the rebirth plaque, temporary rebirth plaque. Um, is there any effect in our life or our body? Because last week, I happened to request two temporary uh, rebirth plaque. One is for a baby, and another one is for a 60 years old uh, ladies in Vietnam. And I felt that my body become uh, uh, icky. And I don't know if uh, by requesting those plaques has any effect in my uh, body or not. Thank you, Master. Mm. Okay, good question. Uh, first of all, I commend you for uh, trying to help these people who died. When you get the rebirth plaques like that, uh, it's a lot more helpful than you realize uh, because um, and the and and you were very sensitive. That's impressive. That when after you request those, <laughs> requested those rebirth plaques, you you felt there's a there's a price you had to pay, right? The body felt uh, uh, w was affected, right? So uh, that's very good. Uh, 
That's part of uh, the process. Yeah. Uh, first of all, um, when you help someone, there's a price to pay. Okay? There's no such a thing as there's no free lunch. You, uh, when you help someone, uh, you prov you providing relief for their suffering. Okay? Someone is supposed to suffer. And if they don't suffer, someone else has to suffer. That's a law of cause and effect. The suffering doesn't poof, vanish because you decide to, to help someone. It just goes somewhere else. It goes to little boys if they choose to. Okay? They usually, it goes because they're supposed to suffer. Uh, and usually it goes to you because you're the one who prevents them from suffering. So it should tell you, it, it teaches you two things. Number one, that you're helping them. Yeah? Okay? You, you're providing help. That's why you feel there is a weight with your action, your karmas. Okay? Yeah. So you see, in a way, it helps you, it helps you realize, oh wow, I am making a difference. All right? Uh, and the, the way you feel shows that you are suffering. They suffer and you are suffering as a result of trying to help them, of helping them. Okay? Mm. And that's part of your blessings because it's a teaching that it helps you develop compassion. Okay? You help someone relieve their suffering, you should feel the suffering so that it's real to you. It's not like something that, you know, it's just suffering. Suffering is something experienced, something felt. And in Buddhism, in Mahayana in particular, the way we train you in compassion is to help you experience suffering and then help you overcome the suffering so that you are no longer afraid of suffering when you help people. Does it make sense? This is very Mahayana. So, it's, so assume, for example, that you ask me to help these two people and nothing happens to you, okay, except that you spend a little bit of money. For you, that amount of money is not suffering, is it? I'm asking, I'm just asking. I don't know. I, c I cannot tell anymore. <laughs> Before I could look at people's clothing and say, oh, you're rich. But now I can't. <laughs> My point being that is that if you don't have money and you somehow stole the money to help them, then you have to suffer in other ways. But the point here is that, is that the, 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 the beautiful thing about this is that you experience suffering from helping, but not to the point where it's overwhelming you that you will never dare do it again. So for example, if they're suffering 100%, you experience about up to the level where it's manageable to you. Looking at you right now, oh, it's about 2%. Okay? So that you convince that you're learning. And you say, if you said, okay, I help, and you, it's just like a casual thing for you, then you develop no wisdom at all. You develop, develop real, very shallow compassion. But in, on the other hand, when this happens, and a lot of people, by the way, they help. They get these temporary rebirth plaques to help others, help a cat. I hear all the time, it cooks squirrels and, you know. It, to, to the point where, you know, our people are so busy doing you know, these <laughs> one month, two month things, okay? Uh, but we're not complaining. They, they all gladly do that. But the point is that a lot of these people, when they help these, these beings, it's like nothing, nothing happens to them. 
because their the skill level is so high. So when they experience, you know, whatever, when they get 100% of this suffering of the beings they're helping, they feel nothing at all. It doesn't affect them. Okay? Hmm. But for you, uh, you're a lot more sensitive because your, your, your skill level is not that high yet. So what happens is this genius of the Dharma is that you are being passed on a tiny percentage for you to experience the pain and suffering that these beings go through. It weren't for you. It's a lot, lot, they're much worse off. Okay? And the rest of suffering goes to, as I said, the boys over there. Okay? So, it will not do you any harm. Okay? Because your body can recover from that. It's very much like, you know, so someone punches you in the arm. So what? Yes, you feel it, but then it's no, not a big deal. Okay? Yeah, you're very sensitive. Yes, yeah. Okay? But don't worry. Does it help? Cảm ơn thầy. Con cảm ơn thầy. Hmm. Okay, very good. Anyone else? Okay. The reason I want to talk to you about this is because there's a question I want to ask. Can we move on? Okay. Next, 87. Hmm. Uh, so basically here, uh, 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 in, in this uh, sentence here, in Master Yung Cha, uh, this is evidence that he's, his level of enlightenment is pretty high. He's not quite Mahasattva level yet, but he's up there. Okay? Because the rest of the information tells us that he's not a Mahasattva level. He's like uh, borderline between uh, regular Bodhisattva and Mahasattva. In that there's, there's, a, there's a borderline there. He's that level. Okay? He's, that's why this work should be taken seriously. It's profound. It's not low level at all. Okay? It's worth our time. Mm. And then, this, this is a one I want to ask you about. Summon a wooden statue and inquire of it. The reason I want to ask you about it is because I have some Chinese-speaking people here, which I normally don't get away from Mountain Temple. And so I ask you, what does it mean? Is this a Chinese tradition here? Is this why you, is, you know, what, is, well, uh, what does it mean in your culture? Why are you looking at it? Google. Search. <laughs> Gee, everyone. <laughs> oh. Jeez. Okay? Yeah. So it's interesting. He says, he, what he just said here is very profound. He says, there's, if there is really no production, don't think it's just true emptiness alone. True emptiness does not exist without wonderful existence. That's high-level wisdom, high-level enlightenment wisdom. Okay? That's fine. Yeah. But then the next section I don't get. It just says, summon a wooden statue and inquire of it. What it has to do with, with enlightenment, high-level enlightenment, wooden statues? You see? See, I can uh, think, uh, looking at the Chinese movies where they, they play these, uh, these wooden things, they pull the strings and so forth, marionettes maybe. Uh, but what does it have to do with wisdom? Why would you... Uh, Huanchi, uh, why do you call uh, a wooden statue, a marionette, man, and ask? Okay, someone wooden statue run. It, it, they didn't. They didn't translate run here in English. Okay, so he says, call a, a marionette man and ask why
Okay, why are you looking at it? Okay. So what I don't understand is that he's talking about true emptiness and wonderful existence. That's a very high level of enlightenment and wisdom. Um, and then he says, ask, ask a man who does a marionette. Call him and ask. Okay. This is why we need to go back to your Chinese uh, heritage and culture and find out, okay? Because we have no clues. DTT answer. Well, Master, I, I think uh, in that case, the that's a wooden because that does, I think that style is non-speakable. So is that like you ask a wooden um, body? I think that's what that means. Then why ask? Yeah. If they're unspeakable, it cannot be explained. And why ask? And then the translation, they did not translate the, the character here, Zhen, okay? Yeah. Someone, a man who does marionettes and ask. The translation is off, I think. Okay, so uh, I move on to the next section while people are doing some research. Hopefully, in the future, we get some feedback and clarify it, because I have no idea why, why, why to use a marionette, okay? Next one, 89, apply yourself to seeking Buddhahood. Sooner or later, you will accomplish it, okay? Also, this is great wisdom from Master Yongjia, also great compassion from Master Yongjia. Mm. He says, uh, uh, Mm. You should seek Buddha good, Buddhahood, okay? Uh, you make the effort to become a Buddha, okay? And Shu uh, Kung, okay? And so you should, you should, uh, you should, is it apply yourself? Mm. Uh, I think. Shu here, uh, shu here has to do with giving. Uh, so should we say uh, apply yourself, or you should say give and work? Practice giving and work hard? Or should you combine shu gong as apply yourself? I'm asking you. Wow, mm, so talkative today. <laughs> Go ahead, Way Mountain. Master, I'm not really sure, but we're going back to that a wooden statue man. Um, for Korean translation, the wooden statue man stands for. Uh, uh, comparing to a human being uh, made of five elements. That's what it says about the wooden statue man. And why ask a man about no production and, and, uh, and uh, not non-production? True emptiness and wonderful existence. Okay. You see, it's funny that this wonderful Chinese wisdom is somehow uh, is lost through the ages and through translation as a result. It's a shame. Okay. Hmm. 
Okay. So what he's talking about here, and again, the translation here is uh, could be a little bit better. Uh, he says, "You should seek Buddhahood. Okay, you should uh, donate your effort." Give efforts, okay? Not just apply yourself, just you need to donate your work. And this is very profound in Chinese. You're not, in English, if you say apply yourself, it does not capture the shu gong, okay? Shu gong here in Chinese means that you have, this is, this is his wisdom, you have to work at practicing giving. Yes, uh, five. Um, Master, I searched online about the Ji Guan Mu Ren. I will try to read this and try my best to translate, even though I don't know how to combine these two together. So in Chinese, Ji Guan Mu Ren, Bi Yu Wu Yun Zhi Shu Jia. I think what they're trying to say is um, the Ji Guan Mu Ren, it's almost like a marionette or a puppet. They uh, kind of like uh, when we couldn't see our real Buddha nature, we totally afflicted or being manipulated by the five senses. It's just like a puppet. It's just like we're totally manipulated by something else, but without our own nature, or we don't know who we are, who we really are. Okay. So it sounds like Ji Guan Mu is like a puppet or manipulated by something else, but without okay. self-nature. Okay, excellent. That helps. Mm, very good. What about the rest of you? Just give the others a chance. Yes, too. I read a multiple article on this one line. Everybody says slightly different things, so I think it might need some time for us to research further and consolidate the feedback. Okay. Otherwise, just everybody's saying different things. Okay, very good. But uh, the, uh, the input really is helpful. I'm looking at the wrong, the wrong side of the equation. I'm looking for understanding what he's mentioning, wooden statue here. It refers to the un, un the, the the not understood side, not the wisdom side, but the non wisdom side. Okay, meaning that you know, wooden statue here is an analogy, as as uh, as uh, what I heard so far, is uh, it's an analogy of a regular man, is equated to a regular person. Human being is basically a wooden statue who has no real wisdom. It has to be manipulated by commerce. We think we're in the control in our lives, of our lives, but we're not. Actually, we are guided by our karmas. And until we have wisdom, we have no way of staying in control. Okay? So that's why he says, you don't believe me, okay? Just ask anyone. And you find out that these people have no idea of true emptiness, have no idea of wonderful existence. And I, and I rest my case. You see, ask anyone. And you see that anyone that you talk to that does not understand, you know, uh, that, that out there, uh, they are just like wooden statues. They don't know about this emptiness without no thought, no birth, the things that were discussed up to this point, okay? So that's his proof. He says, you talk to regular, the regular Joes, they would not be able to understand this. They probably will laugh at us, okay? And say, you are speaking nonsense. You're asking about, you inquiring about nonsense, okay? They dismiss this. Okay? And they don't realize that their lies are, are actually are, they live like marionettes, controlled by their own karmic retributions. 
they have no control over their lives. They think they're in control, but they're not. And that's the nature of existence. Last night, some men talked to me, I'm not suffering at all, okay? Uh, I don't feel any suffering, it's not that bad. But this is suffering. You don't have control over your lives, okay? Uh, you just don't want to face it. Yeah? Okay? I think that's, uh, that, um, that's very helpful. But of course, if you can find more information, I appreciate it. Okay? Yeah. So you see, sometimes, uh, sometimes you can explain about the wonderful existence and true emptiness, but then people will not understand. So the clever thing about Master Yung Cha is that he says, it's not about this. I can elaborate this, but you won't understand. Let me tell you about the state of the opposite of that, of a marionette. Okay? It's, that's why it's such a clever uh, Chan uh, handbook. You too. Thank you, Mister. I, uh, we have some comments here. Uh, a comment from Bonte Varapano. Dear Master, the wooden statue has Buddha nature. Inquire of it is to inquire into our own Buddha nature. Uh, Chun says, wooden robot. And T.S. Geppetto says, maybe we should watch the Disney movie Pinocchio for clues. Movie night. Okay. See, this is a rhetorical question. He says, just ask a marionette and see if they can answer you. Ask if, they, if the marionette can, can help you understand true emptiness and wonderful existence. See, there, there you go. I rest my case. So this is a rhetorical question. So actually, the translation, uh, because of this uh, poor translation, uh, the, it causes confusion. So, uh, so it should be, would you be able to ask a wooden statue for answers, between parentheses for answers? If we talk about who, who has, if there is no production, there is also nothing not produced. Would you be able to ask a wooden statue to get an answer is what it really means. Okay? It's a rhetorical question, but the translation, they missed it completely. And unfortunately, Master Xinhua didn't explain it either. Uh, all right? Mm. And next, uh, we're running out of time. Apply again here, it, it, this is why the English translation is very important. Uh, unless you understand the teachings, your translation causes confusion. Like the last sentence, the last phrase. Clearly, it's a bad translation. Please fix it, Xin Xin. Okay? Yeah. Would you be able to ask a marionette and get the answer? Between parentheses and get an answer? Okay? Change it so that it's, uh, they should not be laughing at our English translation. Again, here also is off as well. Uh, he says, seek Buddhahood, seek to become a Buddha. That's a heartfelt advice from Master Yung Cha. He says, just between us, seek to become a Buddha, okay? And donate your efforts. The Hinayana, they said, apply yourself. Yeah? Because this person is Hinayana. Remember I talked about Masha Shinoha's side? It's Hinayana Mahayana because they, are, they only understand applying efforts. They don't understand wonderful existence yet. In order to get the wonderful existence, that's when you say, donate your efforts. Okay? 
That's Mahayana. Mahayana. Okay? Seek to become a Buddha. Donate your efforts because I want to stress that. You need to donate your work. Look at, don't look at it as don't look at it as crossing your legs for yourself. Wait, wait, let me take it back. <laughs> you weaklings. <laughs> you always complain, oh, it hurts so much. Hurt so much. <laughs> Look at his donating efforts for someone else. If you only practice for yourself, your resolves are so small. If you're only scheming for yourself, girls, that's all you're going to get. Things that only benefit yourself, and that doesn't take much. You don't require much to be happy. There's a very subtle difference here, folks. If you seek to help others, then you have a bigger achievement. The more others you want to help, the bigger your achievement. If, on the other hand, you're like Hinayana and you go to Vipassana, and again, no offense to all those practitioners, you also have Vipassana in Mahayana as well. We are called Vipassana, but our Vipassana practice is very different from yours. Okay? But the difference is that when we donate our efforts, our cultivation is a form of donation for others. It's not for ourselves. And that's why children, monks and nuns, that's why I've been teaching you. As long as people come to us, come to you, which says, I have this problem. I want to fix it. Okay? That's when Chan can help. You come to me and say, I want to feel good. I say, so do I. But I have, have, haven't had much success feeling good all these years. <laughs> okay? Uh, because the bigger your problems, the more we can help. But if you say, I want to feel better, I want to feel good, it doesn't take long, five minutes. And then you come back next week for another five minutes. That's all, okay? But if you donate your efforts, donation here means that your work, your cultivation is a donation for something else more than just for yourself. And that's how, if you do that, sooner or later you will succeed. And that's not talk about Buddhahood here. He says Buddhahood here refers to a goal, meaning like very much we know that setting your goals is very important. Okay? So you set a goal that's worthy of you. The goal that's worthy of all of us is to seek to become a Buddha. All of you. Okay? Don't listen to the Chinese and say, you women, you cannot become Buddha. Don't believe that. Okay? You should seek to become a Buddha. Okay? And donate your efforts. Meaning, you seek for yours. You don't seek for yourself. You see that? Donate the effort of seeking to become a Buddha for something else, or something bigger than yourself. Then sooner or later you will succeed. Yes, too. Question on the translation. Chiu Fu in Chinese not necessarily mean seeking Buddhahood for yourself. It can be also seeking help from the Buddha. Um, yeah. So I can be seeking help from the Buddha and donate my efforts, and yeah. then I will soon later accomplish it. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. But that's Chinese. I'm not Chinese. I don't subscribe to your Chinese way of thinking. Okay, you always say, "Chiu Fu, Chiu Fu, Chiu Pu Sa, Chiu Bei." I say, "Two Chinese." Okay, now, here what he's talking about is that goal setting. Why are you doing this? You doing this to help yourself, to help others. That's very important. 
this Sikh Buddhahood here is referring to set a goal that's lofty, that is difficult for you to attain. That's what it means. It's not meaning that get help from a Buddha, get help from a Bodhisattva. That's a different, different uh, uh, school. It's not Chan. Okay, Chan, we don't, we don't seek help from the Buddha. My goodness, only Taiwanese do that. <laughs> okay, we don't in Chan, we don't seek help from the Buddha. We take it. Okay, and so, uh, so seek, set a goal to become Buddha, and that's I'm going to explain this next and before I, I stop. What it also means is that if you seek, for example, uh, to become an arhat, is that seeking Buddhahood? Yes, it is. Any lofty goal that's bigger than you, okay, uh, and you should go, okay, and you apply effort, you donate your efforts. You don't apply efforts, get Hinayana path. You donate your efforts, it's Mahayana path. Then you become, you get to your goal. Okay? So that's why in Chan, we don't tell you, we don't tell people who are not Buddhists to seek to become a Buddha. We said, what do you want? What are you looking for? Wealth? Fame? Hmm? Family? Health? All those goals there are part of seeking Buddhahood, by the way. That's all included in Buddhahood. You cannot become a Buddha unless you are able to learn how to solve all those aforementioned problems you have. Okay, so seek Buddhahood here, seek Buddhahood here refers to set a lofty goal. Don't, I want you to challenge yourself and think bigger and bigger more than you can imagine. Because Buddhahood here refers to something that you, is so big, so lofty that you don't even understand. But others have achieved it already. Why not you? You can do just like them. This is what they did. They seek, they set that lofty goal, seeking become Buddhahood. They donated their efforts, okay? And, and eventually they did accomplish it. He's referring to who? Him. He says, I'm not a Buddha yet, but that's what I've been doing. Yeah? Okay. We stop here today. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Xin Xin, can you correct this as well? Okay. Yeah. Seek Buddhahood. Don't need your efforts. I want to turn this into a Mahayana Chan translation, not this is Hinayana Chan. Okay. Yes. Seven. Yeah, Master, I, I did a Google search and I saw an excerpt from uh, Mas, uh, Venerable Master Xuanhua. He mm -hmm. explained this uh, in December of 1965. He's not that good yet. <laughs> <laughs> He's too early in his career. Yes. What did he explain? Okay, so basically he says that uh, the meaning of this phrase um, he says, uh, those who pray to the Buddha and perform meritorious deeds will achieve success sooner or later. It is not advisable to focus on two sides. One, only seek the Buddha, or two, only seek yourself. Um, because that will not lead you on the right path. And not only that, but it will lead to misunderstandings. Those who seek Buddha will be attached to his appearance and develop a sense of dependence, and they will succeed regardless of whether it will happen sooner or later. And then those who seek themselves will be obsessed with themselves and become stubborn. True. 
And then he also said, furthermore, if you can wholeheartedly pray to the Buddha and work hard, you will be successful sooner or later. So Chinese. You're right. You know, it's so Chinese of all of you. <laughs> I want to interpret it in the, the Mahayana, Mahayana thing, not the Chinese thing. Okay? I stick to my guns. Well, that's very good. Thank you for the input. That's a very good explanation. Now I see why, why they're, they're stuck there. His disciples. Because they're still seeking the Buddha's help. There's no need to seek the Buddha's help. As I said yesterday, they're not here anymore. Uh, last night, when you took refuge and you made a vow, or oh, and you plant the seeds, they say, I want to become a Buddha, okay? And all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas came to your ceremony. You know what happens? I didn't say it last night because I didn't want to sound too cheap. They all came because when that happens, the atmosphere of the Buddha Hall changes completely every single time I've done it. Every single time. Why is that? They're here because we cannot feel them, but we can feel their bodyguards. Like when, when President Biden walks around, you see there's always an old man who walks in front of him. Hey, get out of here. That kind of thing. So they're very threatening. They're very aggressive. So that's why you can feel the difference of their, of the Buddha's uh, bodyguards. They fill up this tiny, tiny Buddha hall here. So you can feel the difference right away. Okay? And so, so they came to help you create this indestructible Vajra seed in your eighth consciousness. It says, I want to become a Buddha. I seek Buddhahood. And that seed there will be there forever. Indestructible. Lifetime after lifetime, nothing can destroy it. Even if you fall into the animal realm, it cannot be destroyed. You fall to the hells, it cannot be destroyed. Until it's time, and the Buddhas, all these Buddhas who came, the few of them who came, remember, they've been watching you all this time. And they said, I will help them, will help this person realize this vow to become enlightened. So they came to help you create a seat here forever, and then they watch you, they watch over you until the seat matures. That's how, why it's so important. The Chinese fail to explain it to their followers. It is critical part of our success without the Buddhas watching over us, forget it. We don't have, we don't have a prayer or a chance. And that's why you see why it's so important to have these Vajra seats. And then they in the background watch over us. That's why seeking Buddhahood here is critical. Is that clear? It's way beyond us. Our worlds, our visions are so small, so self-serving, so limited. Okay, so would that, would that taking very few things there, the seats are forever, and furthermore, a step further that we don't explain to you is that Buddhas watch over you. You don't need to seek his help anymore. It's too Chinese. Okay, I want you to be different. Wait, you're Chinese. Okay, if you allow yourself to be less Chinese, how's that? Okay? So, uh, so this seeking here, seek Buddhahood here, actually, it also creates subsidiary seats as well. Okay? And please don't tell people this. Uh, Every time the people, I, I never said anything, and don't tell the Koreans they're crazy about this. 
every time that you took, take, uh, took refuge, and then there's a few ceremonies, and you do it again, you have more Vajra seeds. That's why the Chinese are very small. <laughs> That's why they kept on coming and coming and coming and take refuge again. And they said, you know, uh, why are you coming here? Oh, we help you, we support these people. Well, actually, what they're doing is planting more Vajra seeds. The more, the better. All right? Hmm. Yes, two. Master, you mean you can take a refugee multiple times? You bet. I do. Uh, okay. Every time I do a ceremony with you, I actually take refuge with the Buddha again. <laughs> because every time we make a vow, I vow to become a Buddha, because the, 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 the text says so. I vow to become a Buddha. That's a seat right there. Every single time. Yeah, four. Thank you, Master. I, I got a, uh, some explanation about the Huan Chu Ji Guan Mu Ren Wen. Do you want this now? Or oh, I, I, I can share that. Sure, yeah. now. Why not? Uh, so the, that means the Mu Ren is uh, like a robot. They, can, they have a hand and they, maybe they can move like a function, but they, they don't have a, a full source or true man, so they cannot be Buddha. So uh, we, should, uh, we, we shouldn't learn, we shouldn't be a, a, a robot. Uh, it's, uh, um, but we have a confusion. Um, we need, uh, but there's always have a, a Buddha nature inside. So we need, uh, um, the Ji Guan means so. Uh, um, sorry. Mechanism. Mechanism? Mm hmm Okay. Um, so we need to uh, uh, find our true nature and can be a Buddha. Buddha. It's a, oh, Ji Guan is a Zi Shen de Wu Ming Yi Shi. What? Ji, ji, what? Ji Guan. The, is what? The phrase I couldn't hear. Wu Ming Yi Shi. Wu Ming Yi Shi. Yeah. What's Yi? Yi Shi, consciousness. Okay, very good. Okay. Okay. Thank you much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, it's uh, very helpful. It, it's, uh, it's consistent with what we discussed so far. Okay. Uh, and uh, and I, all I have to say is that if you will, Mm. Uh, in light of uh, the current state of technology, Ji Guan is like AI robot. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Doesn't matter how smart they are, how well programmed they are, they can never become a Buddha. They cannot give you, give you answers on how to open your wisdom. That's not possible. Okay? Mm. Yes, two. One last question. Um, what does it mean for a baby to take a refugee? They can vow, and they don't know what they are taking. So what does it mean when they take a refugee? Ah, good thing. I used to tell them, don't take a refuge, but now I changed my mind. Because of the Vajra seats, it doesn't matter. Remember last night, people asked, I really don't believe the Buddhahood thing here. Why do, you have, do I have to take refuge? I feel like I'm lying. I'm not being honest. And don't you think, the answer is, don't you think Buddhists know that? <laughs> okay. And then I used, that's why in earlier days, I pretended to be humble because I didn't want to you to be my disciples, like, don't know anything. <laughs> okay. But... In light of the Vajra seats, I understand the process now. I would recommend that everyone to take refuge, babies included. Living Buddhism fully yet, it's okay. Yeah, most 99% of the people who take refuge don't believe in it. It doesn't bother us. 
We say, it's like, you know, you're like a marionette, but what can we do? <laughs> okay? Thank you, everyone. Let's go to lunch. Wow, the boys are so well behaved today. <laughs> <laughs>